let me just thank you all for, for being here. Um, this is uh, kind of a new experience for me. I was only in other Zoom. So I was in the Zoom conference, but we did people with, with photographs here or your video. So it's great to see you all. Um, uh, thank Barb for putting this together. And, and thank you to the friends of uh, Coronado and Hamas Historic Sites. Uh, that's, uh, those are sites that I'm um, so thrilled to be able to address to you all. Um, I've been giving this lecture since about 2010. So this, this lecture has been in one form or another for 10 years. And I think I did this lecture to the court, in the Coronado room one time in, uh, in uh, the historic site. Um, so it's a thrill to be able to give it to you again. Uh, New Mexico is a place of deep history and rich, uh, deep history and rich heritage. Um, but like this quote from uh, or Lou Wallace, New Mexico is a place different. All calculations based on experience elsewhere fail in New Mexico. At the turn of the 20th century, New Mexico is not like the other 49 states in the Union, or 46 states and some territories. We have desert, not woodlands, dry, not wet, wild, not tamed, Hispanic, American, not Anglo, Catholic, not Protestant. Um, Mexico is a unique state and a place different than that of the rest of the United States. Uh, we are historically diverse with people from many cultures living, working, and raising their families. This might seem ordinary today, but 108 years ago, uh, as New Mexico joined the Union as a newly minted state, we were an anomaly state different that eventually changed the United States into the multicultural country that it is today. So before we, but before we became a state, we stumbled to statehood as a territory for 62 years. But there are many issues caused by the long march to statehood. Um, Easterners opposed state because they feared that New Mexico's predominantly Hispanic and Indian population was too foreign Catholic. Mexico suffered from unfavorable reaction in the press to the crime and lawlessness during our Wild West period with Billy the Kid and the Colfax County War. In 1870, an editorial in the New York Times called the story the heart of our worst civilization. Political maneuvering, both uh, within the state's political parties as well as nationally, stymied many efforts at statehood. Lastly, we were joined with Arizona in a troublesome alliance that further proved to the smooth passage into, into a union. So you can see here the question of US territory becoming states with the red on, uh, on the East Coast and seen pretty much for until we jump into Cal Oregon in 1850 uh, and then, then back and link up at uh, the Rocky Mountain areas. And we became in 1912. Uh, the last with Arizona, the last in, in, the, in the continental United States without Alaska there, the last, uh, last territory, the last state. Uh, the Mexican-American War, 46 to 1840, ended uh, New Mexico's 20 years as a Republic of Mexico. And this is where U.S. took half of Mexico, present day uh, Southwest and California. The Treaty of Guadalupe, Hidalgo, which you can see and I'm sure you all can read it very well there on the right, uh, signed on February 2nd, 1848, and ratified three months later, gave U.S. citizenship to all Mexican nationals who remained in the ceded territory in New Mexico and, and elsewhere. Uh, only a few Nuevo Mexicanos, uh, around 2,000, left New Mexico and went down to first to uh, Mesilla, which was part of Mexican territory uh, farther south. The treaty all guaranteed, and I think this is pretty important, certain civil, political, and religious rights to the Spanish-speaking people of New Mexico, and it attempted to protect their culture and language. Now, what does it take to become a statehood? Well, here you can see that they have to propose a, a, a sympathetic principles of democracy, have to have a majority of the electorate desire statehood, that the proposed state has to have sufficient population. Back then, it was about 50,000 in order to support state government. Um, it's important to understand that the ultimate decision 
on whether to become a state belongs with the U.S. Congress, not with the people of the territory, not with the people of New Mexico. And it's the Congress, and particularly the Senate, makes its decisions based on the interests and values of the elected uh, legislators. Uh, and those are people who aren't of the territory. It's a fundamental political process determined by existing states and their federal elective officers. Um, so right after the signing of the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo, which incorporated New Mexico and Arizona, which is part of New Mexico territory, California, uh, and some parts of other states there, um, a backlash occurred. So here is Senator Calhoun uh, speaking in the, in the Senate in January of 1848. To incorporate Mexico would be the very first instance of incorporating an Indian race and uh, for more than half of the Mexicans are Indians and the others composed chiefly of mixed tribes. I protest against such a union as that. Oh, sir, a government of a white race. The greatest misfortunes of Spanish America are of placing these colored races on an equality with the white race. So now you're gonna see, now you're getting a taste of where I'm going with this, <laughs> of why it took 62 years to become a state. But let's get down to the specifics of New Mexico. Uh, statehood was almost attained in 1850, lost by a handshake in 1875, by an impetuous word in 1889, the shiver of malaria in 18, uh, 1894, and finally succeeded in 1912. Uh, after we became a territory in 1850, or even before that, Governor Donaciano Dona Bill called a convention in October of 1848 in Santa Fe, uh, after the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo ended military government. Um, they elected Padre Martinez there on the right uh, uh, of Taos as the president of the convention and asked for the immediate establishment of territorial government. That didn't happen for two years. I think you all know, mañana doesn't mean tomorrow, it just means not today. Um, Constitutional Convention was assembled in May 15th, 1850. Kind of hard with the mute to hear all of the laughter from that joke, but I'll just assume that some of you are laughing. So uh, two key provisions of this Constitutional Convention, the Declaration Against Slavery and the Support of Public Education. This was voted on in New Mexico by our residents, 8,300 kids won for uh, this Constitution. 39 against. Um, New Mexicans even elected a governor, lieutenant governor, senators, and started to enact legislation. In the meantime, the U.S. Congress enacted the Compromise of 1850, which nullified all of New Mexico's actions. So here's the map of the Compromise of 1850. I'm not going to go into it too much because it's it's a, it's a lot to say. We can talk about that just for the next half hour. Um, but it, it uh, um, uh, basically, it's made this territory of New Mexico, as you can see, part of New Mexico, part of present-day Arizona, part of present-day Nevada, part of present-day Colorado. Um, but that was all the territory of New Mexico. Um, California was admitted as a free state, and that raised the alarms of the southern, southern um, uh, congressmen especially senators, because of the balance between southern and northern states up to then. Now, with California as a free state, it would throw off that balance. The act also settled the boundary dispute between Texas and New Mexico, um, uh, because Texas claimed uh, uh, territory all the way to the Rio Grande. So, all the way, so this would have been all Texas territory. Um, according to the Compromise, Texas relinquished this, uh, this land in the dispute and were given $10 million money it used to offer the state of Mexico. Um, territories in New Mexico, Nevada, Arizona, Utah would be organized without mention of slavery. So then comes this first Texas land grab of 1850. So if you see up here, maybe you have wondered why is a piece of this jutting in to the eastern border of New Mexico, right here, because here, Oklahoma, and then it juts in four miles 
and it goes down like this. Because uh, uh, in the surveying of the border between Texas and New Mexico, uh, with the compromise of 1850, um, the Texans did the surveying and they decided to, wouldn't it be necessary an extra four miles? Doesn't sound like much, but that's a 300 mile line north to south. And so that's about 1,200 square miles that were lost to Texas. Um, on the right here is a photograph of mile marker for Interstate 40 in Texas. So all of the land behind this should be New Mexico. And I hope you'll agree with me, and I think it's time that we ask Texas to give that land back to us. New Mexico lost their land during uh, Civil War uh, up until um, 1866. Uh, New Mexico had that part of Arizona and Nevada, and it was taken away, and also a little bit of Colorado as well. Uh, calls for elections and constitutions happened in 1867. Happened in 1872. A comprehensive constitution was created and printed. So a constitution was approved, state constitution. Hopefully, we could become a state. State officers were elected. Uh, but territorial governor Gibbs nullified the election, and so all of that work was for naught. The U.S. House of Representatives came bills for admission of New Mexico State in almost every session, um, that even, and even held hearings at times, but uh, no definite action was taken. In 1869, an attempt was, was made uh, to make New Mexico a state, and it was called Lincoln, but that was defeated in the Senate. Now, why? Well, these are some of the patterns in the back east of how New Mexico was viewed. So Representative Tappan uh, from New Hampshire in the Congressional Group said in February 1861, there are other and all sufficient reasons outside of the slavery question while New Mexico ought not to be admitted as a state. Her system of peonage or white slavery, the paucity or poverty of her white inhabitants, the mongrel character of the mass of her people, and their entire unfitness to be incorporated into the union are enough to deter me from voting for this measure. Uh, thank you, Representative Chapman. Here's Harper's 1876. The proposition of the admission of New Mexico as a state to have a community almost without the characteristic and indispensable qualities in, of an American state and which shall have a representation in the National Senate as large as New York and in the House shall be equal to Delaware. It is virtually an ignorant foreign community under the influence of the Roman Church and neither for the advantage of the Union nor for its own benefit can such an addition to the family of American states be urged. Ouch. I just canceled my subscription to Harper's Um, What was happening in New Mexico during the latter part of the, of the 19th century, the Gilded Age? Well, there was a corrupt political and economic organization which dominated uh, a lot of aspects of New Mexico from the 1870s to even, even to statehood. It was called the Sniffy Wind. Some of you might have heard of that. It was an equal opportunity to corruption. It was nonpartisan, merchants, lawyers, politicians, by people involved in railroads, cattle ranching, mining. New Mexico had a few natural resources, but uh, our most important resource back then was land. The Spanish and Mexican land grants uh, were particularly vulnerable to manipulation. Um, and that's because they were not uh, uh, clearly uh, surveyed when those grants were made, sometimes back in the 1600s, um, when uh, land transfer was being um, legally done, notices would be published in English speaking newspapers. And a lot of the Spanish inhabitants of these land grants weren't reading English speaking newspapers. Um, so the communal private land grant of the Spanish and Mexican heritage is kind of a foreign concept to, to the United States, as, at least uh, back then. Um, and the introduction of capitalism and wage labor stressed some economies for Hispanics, uh, and they sold their interest in the grant, which unscrupulous agents took to an agreement to sell the whole grant. So they would sell what they thought was just maybe their home or something 
but the agents would say, okay, now I got the whole line grant. An example of this is the Maxwell line grant. Originally, the Bobian Miranda line grant in 1841 was originally nine, uh, 97,000 acres, but through uh, creative resurveys, it was expanded to almost 2 million acres. Displaced homesteaders, others who bought land, and it also launched the Colfax County War. Um, and, the, and the Santa Fe Ring also had their, uh, had their policy in the Lincoln County War as well. Santa Fe Ring used violence to get their way. Um, if we needed it. So let's take a quick gander on who, who the Santa Fe Ring were, at least who two of the leaders were. were. This is Thomas Catron. I'll talk about first. The other one is Stephen Elkins. Um, Catron was a Civil War Confederate veteran, uh, moved to Mesilla right after the war, uh, studied law and Spanish. By 1869, he was the territorial attorney general, and his friend Cat, uh, uh, Elkins, who I'll talk about in a minute, was the U.S. territorial uh, attorney. And their law firm, Catron and Elkins, um, perhaps directed New Mexico political history for the rest of the century. They represented land grant dependents or defendants. Um, from protecting the holding, and if they won, the communities would give them some of the land because it was a cash poor community. And if they lost, then this land was available and the lawyers would go and buy it. At one point, Catron was the biggest landholder, private landholder in the country, and he owned two million acres of land. This is the other main leader of, uh, of the Santa Fe Ring, Stephen Elkins, a union vet who came to the sea in 1864, quickly elected to the state legislature. His nickname was Smith Steve Elkin or Smith Steve. He wanted to become a U.S. senator and thought New Mexico was the quickest uh, route to become a senator. Um, but he sabotaged that with, a, with an invaded headache in 1874. He introduced an enabling act to, uh, to uh, make New Mexico uh, a state. It passed the House 160 to 54. It passed the Senate 32 to 11. But there were some differences, as there often is, between the Senate and the House resolutions. So it had to go back to the House right before that, that session was over. Um, only a few days. And, and uh, this man called Julius Caesar Burroughs. Why don't we name our kids like that anymore? Julius Caesar Burroughs. Of course, he's going to be a politician. He was of Michigan. And he, he got up in the House and gave the what's called the bloody shirt speech, which said that all of the ills of the country are because of the Confederates and the way the bloody shirt of the Civil War, metaphorically. Um, and, uh, uh, and he also talked about the protection of the civil rights of, of freed slaves. Elkins wasn't in the chamber for this speech. He was outside conversing with friends. And he came in just as Burroughs finished speaking and not hearing any of it, gave Burroughs a congratulatory handshake. And Southern representatives who saw Elkins do this thought, mm, we don't want that kind of guy in, in the house. He's going to support Northern, Northerners and, and not the Southerners. And so the house didn't act on it. Uh, and the enabling act was lost. Uh, Elkins, who wanted to be a U.S. senator, moved to West Virginia, where he was elected senator in 1895, having served as President Harrison's Secretary of War in 1891. He died in 1911 in office, right before we became a state. Here's another guy who, uh, who had something to do with our long stumble to statehood. Representative Struble of I think he's of Iowa. Uh, in 1887, there was a bill to admit Washington, Dakota, Montana, and those states. 140 supporting statehood for everybody um, supported it for all, all, all states, all the, all the territories. Uh, but Strubble put out a minority report who opposed admission by New Mexico by attacking the territory and its un American citizens. New Mexico was, was eliminated from this bill, and Washington, Montana, and two Dakotas were admitted as states. So what to do? Well, with previous attempts to gain statehood having failed, Mexico sought, sought a new tact. I think today we would call it rebranding. We branded ourselves as the tri-culture state. Native American, Hispanic, Anglo, 
Now it's true that New Mexico is a historically diverse state. We have had a variety of people here before contact with Plains Indians, Pueblo Indians, Navajo Indians, um, and with contact Mexicans and Spanish, uh, Portuguese, and, and then later after that, Northern Europeans, Southern Af so uh, South Americans, Asians, African Americans. Uh, so it's the 20th century as we were rebranding this, uh, we were a very diverse state. And that's one of the reasons we were denied statehood, I, I venture, I propose to you. Um, did we lead the way in what the rest of the country became in this multicultural world that we live in? Perhaps with New Mexico as a state, we helped the Congress and then the rest of the country accommodate the change in demographics of our country. And how else do we rebrand re ourselves? Well, this is, I think, as you all know, the Palace of the Governors, the seat of Spanish colonial government, Mexican government, territorial government from about, what, 610 to the 1880s when it was, uh, when the, the U.S. territory had its uh, uh, governmental offices in here. Um, so this is what the territorial capital looked like from Spanish colonial times. In 1900, this is what our state capital looked like. And there's actually one before that that burned down. It's very similar. Does this look New Mexican to you? I, I take it from, all, I hear from here, all of you saying no. So, uh, so this is actually more like what a Midwest capital looked like. And we're trying to rebrand ourselves. Hey, we're just the rest of the country. Look at our, look at our state capital. It could be Minnesota. Not that there's anything wrong with Minnesota. It's not New Mexico. So here's President Teddy Roosevelt um, in a quote to territorial governor Jerry. He said, I know your ambition is to have New Mexico made a state, but before you can get statehood, you must clean house in New Mexico and show to Congress that the people of New Mexico are capable of governing themselves. Now, what he really means here is the Santa Fe Ring. We need a clean house of this corrupt political organization because God forbid New Mexico could, should send corrupt legislators to Washington, D.C. Uh, I like to look at political cartoons from the time period. Uh, this, is, this is one of them that I really like. This is in the Literary Digest of 1906. Um, and you can see that there's Arizona, New Mexico, New Mexico, excuse me, Arizona is this kind of uh, southern belle almost, or a cowgirl. And, uh, and, uh, and the New Mexico character is this kind of, I don't know, she's like, Caramba, you know, New Mexico sombrero. There's something suspicious that's smoking falling from his lips. Um, this is because in, in uh, uh, 1906, there was a movement to make New Mexico and Arizona a joint state. But it was about the same time that Oklahoma became a state. Um, now this wasn't accepted by either states. Of course, uh, Arizona Southern Bell says, well, I met up. And of course, the New Mexico guy says, caramba. And this is because the Eastern states didn't want to have two, two states with their own two senators each in Congress. It would, throw off the balance between East and West. Um, so Congress has the joint statehood bill calling the new state Arizona. For New Mexicans, we feared that if we rejected this, it would be another long time before we could become a state. Um, we went to the vote, vote in 1906, and as distasteful as it was, both parties in New Mexico, parties Democrats and Republicans in New Mexico called for accepting joint statehood and worked together to pass the bill. It's not that we wanted joint statehood, but in the belief that Arizona would reject it and we would come out looking kind of good for that, you know, that, that, that we were able to, that we were willing to compromise. New Mexicans voted over 26,000 for joint statehood and a little under 15,000 against statehood. But then it got thrown in, uh, into Arizona. And this is from, uh, uh, from Arizona. I think this is the teachers union, if I'm not mistaken. 
and they published the decided racial difference between the people of New Mexico, who are not only different in race and origin and language, but have entirely different customs and laws and ideals, and would have but little prospect of successful amalgamation. And the objection of the people of Arizona, 95% of whom are Americans, I'm going to come back to that point. To the probability of the control of public affairs by people of a different race, many of whom do not speak the English language and who outnumber the people of Arizona two to one. And in a minute, I'm going to show you the Arizona vote. So I have to come back to that crack about Americans. Now, my understanding is that everybody in the Western Hemisphere, North Americans, Central Americans, South Americans, we're all Americans. So I know it's popular to say that only United Statesians are Americans, but everybody in the same in America. So here's George Floyd vote, You can see New Mexico, you know, green is voting for joint statehood, the red is voting against joint statehood. So you can see that it's over. One rejected. Arizona rejected statehood by a little over 16,000 votes to a little over 3,000 votes. So, but it did not help to say to, to, for New Mexico to be seen as a team player in this. Um, and so we still had to wait a little bit longer. Now we get to our greatest president, President Taft. And I don't say that because he was over 300 pounds. I don't say that because he got stuck in a bathtub in the White House. I say he was our greatest president because he used his political capital to make New Mexico a state. So uh, let's get to the end game of our long stumble to statehood. Uh, the New Mexican delegate, non-voting delegate to the US Congress, by Nima Andrews, um, produced uh, uh, House Resolution 18166 in 1910, and it was the, the, uh, a bill for, for statehood for New Mexico and Arizona, two different states. It passed without opposition and went to the Senate. Um, uh, and, and there was different provisions, of course, uh, but President Taft, the latest president, kind of got the, the, all the different sites together uh, and, 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 it, it, and this enabling act to say, okay, New Mexico, Arizona, start figuring out you're going to be in the state, get a constant, things like that. And so, uh, and so it was on June 20th, 1910, President William H. Taft signed an enabling act, which authorized the territories to call the Constitutional Convention in preparation of being admitted as a state. Uh, on October 3rd of that year, uh, 100, a total of 100 delegates from every county in, in New Mexico territory convened in Santa Fe and drafted a constitution, which was approved by the voters on July, uh, excuse me, on January 21st, 1911. Uh, so New Mexico had a constitution forwarded to the president who approved it on February 24th, 1911. The Senate, however, did not approve it, and it's a kind of a complicated story, but the basic thing is that New Mexico had a pretty conservative constitution. Arizona had a progressive constitution that included things like um, uh, the recall of elected officials, including judges. Um, and so there was a filibuster in Congress to try to force the approval of this progressive constitution. Um, and and uh, and, and, and accept Arizona, even though it had a progressive constitution. Um, but the, so that kind of ground things to a halt. Um, at the end of that session, Taft had to call a special Senate session of Congress right afterwards to deal with several unresolved issues, including statehood. Uh, Katrin vented, he said, it was too bad that we didn't have things. And when things get to the point, where one lousy will can make trouble and do harm, you always find that individual who's equal to the occasion. Um, and you can see here, recalled. <clears throat> and so we have uh, New Mexico on the right, there's uh, on the left, being, being pulled, yanked off the stage with, uh, uh, with a possible veto. Um, but basically this boiled down to a fight over the progressive movement in Congress uh, for more direct participation in democracy. Um, 
mainly because of Arizona having a progressive, um, a progressive constitution. Despite the concerns uh, about the reforms at the in the Arizona Constitution by uh, the Enabling Act passed Congress, that it was still not a done deal. Would Taft sign or veto these constitutions that Arizona and New Mexico separately came up with? Taft vigorously opposed the recall of judges. Um, and even though he supported New Mexico, hinted that he might veto the uh, And he did quite veto it on August 15th um, when it was read to Congress. Uh, because New Mexico um, was in the, even though the target was Arizona's constitution, the hope of statehood was smashed. This is the only time in US history where a president had vetoed a properly presented constitution, which had been accepted by Congress. The Senate did go back and revote on August 17th, a couple of days later, uh, when the recall resolution was yanked out of the Arizona constitution. The House passed it on August 19th, and on August 21st, 1911, Taft signed a compromise resolution if the conditions were met. Uh, last territorial governor uh, Mills called the first state election on November 7th, 1911, uh, and, and uh, we, we elected Governor William McDonald. You can see him here on the left, and Lieutenant Governor Ezekiel C. DeBaca on the right. Back then, we didn't popularly vote, at least in New Mexico, in many states popularly elect our senators. They were chosen by the state, uh, the state legislature, and that was the case in New Mexico with our constitution. So the big prize of statehood were the senators, who were still undecided. Um, those who worked hard to gain statehood in, 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 were in the running. Catherine, here you see on the left, um, Andrews, the fall, Governor Mills. Um, Andrews is a big favorite because he was the uh, a uh, non-voting delegate to, to, uh, to the Congress. Uh, but uh, but uh, the, um, Mills and Andrews faced determined uh, opposition connected to the side of San Efe Ring, Catron and Fall. Bronson Cutting, who later became one of our senators, said of Catron, he was the most unscrupulous man in the Southwest. And he said that Fall was the most dangerous man of the bunch. Uh, as our um, uh, state senators were getting together to elect our federal senators um, uh, before the March 28th election, uh, 17 members of the House joined members of the Senate in the pre-election maneuver, and they declared for fall here on the right instead of Andrews. In the joint assembly of the legislatures, they ratified that action the next day, choosing Choosing Catherine, of course, that was a done deal. But Fall wasn't such a done deal. Um, and four Hispanic legislators, supporters of Andrews, claimed that they were deprived of voting. They, they said they were lured to the Palace Hotel, uh, near where the Santa Library is now, and arrested for trying to sell their votes. They were forced to resign their office and jailed for two nights. After the vote that elected Fall, they were released and reinstated to their offices. Fall responded to the public outcry of his election, quote, the continual yapping and talk about the illegality of my election and that I could not be reelected by this legislature, et cetera, simply aggravates me to the point of stubbornness. And he was stubborn all the way to Washington, DC. And you probably do know that Albert Fall was eventually um, implemented impl not implemented, implicated in the Teapot Dome scandal and uh, as a Secretary of Interior under President Harvey. On Saturday, January 6, 1912, at 1.35 p.m. in Washington, D.C., President William H. Taft signed a proclamation making New Mexico the 47th state of the United States of America. More than 61 years had passed since the first statehood convention had been held in New Mexico. Um, on, on June 20th, 1850. Um, on uh, the, the day New Mexico became a state, Taft and the presence of representatives from Mexico, businessmen, congressmen, um, members of the cabinet, 
Friends of New Mexico put his signature on the proclamation, which he is doing here. After signing it, he turned to the delegates, the delegates from New Mexico and said, well, it is all over. I am glad to give you life. I hope you will be healthy. And here in the political cartoon with statehood. And now, oh my gosh, Mexico kind of looks like that Arizona cowgirl, doesn't she? Once we became, once we, we became a state. As I'm wrapping this up, I just want to say, New Mexico was technically ready to become a state in 1850. We had over 60,000 people. We had a willing popular, populace. Uh, we wrote our own constitution, but many forces arrayed against statehood, anti-Hispanic, anti-Catholic, racist and, 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 religious, and religious prejudices, um, a north-south split, an east-west split, the Santa Fe Ring. Um, is, is Mexico is historically diverse and that counted against us. These obstacles in 1900 have become the mainstream of our nation today. In 1912, New Mexico entered the Union as it had been since first contact by the uh, indigenous people, Europeans, a multi-ethnic country or territory endowed with rich cultural pluralism. But New Mexico was in 1912, the U.S. has become in the last century. So we are a great state full of rich history, deep heritage, frank food, and beautiful landscapes. Um, here is our New Mexico State song, and why don't we all sing along um, to celebrate our, our, our statehood. Um, yeah. No matter where we go, I say, see what's moving. Old fair New Mexico, we love, we love you so. The greatest state I know, New Mexico. Who wrote that? We're ready for some questions. If you have questions. If you have. Yes, okay. Uh, yes. Mary, Mary. Um, I thank you. Thank you so much. This is just a wonderful history and chronology um, with the ins and outs and ups and downs. Um, and your last um, slide uh, before the song, um, you talked about, you know, statehood and then the, um, the barriers of the anti-Hispanic feelings in the country, anti-Catholicism, uh, regional differences, North versus South, power balance, that sort of thing. I. I just kind of worry for us as a nation because we seem to be struggling with those whole things on a much greater palette than just New Mexico now. And I don't know um, what we've learned from the past, but maybe you can help us think through that and in, in what's your maybe um, projection for us for today um, because of the religious and racial and regional um, divisions that we have in this country. Can, can you address that or talk to that at all, Dr. Hunter? Yeah. Thank, thanks for your question. It's, a, it's an important question. Um, there are more people than it. And it's, um, you, know, I, you know, I focused on, I focused on, um, on New Mexico and the racism, the prejudices that um, prevented us from becoming late in 1850 when we should have. Um, and, and part of it was other people in New Mexico, part of it was with New Mexicans themselves, and, you know, uh, um, Elkins with that fatal handshake kind of shot ourselves in the foot with that. Uh, but the larger question, and, and I'm not going to let me just skip ahead. Just I'm going to get a prognosis for the future because I'm sorry, I haven't hard enough time predicting the past and predicting it. Um, but uh, our country um, is, you know, it was um, going back to the colonial period. Uh, was uh, parts of it were built by slaves, and um, and the constitution didn't directly address slavery, but I think there's growing 
um, acknowledgement that the way the Constitution was written with slaves being three-fifths of a human for representation, for counting who, um, what, uh, uh, the, the what chin is for, for, for represent. Um, there's even some historians who say that the Electoral College was put in there to protect slaveholding states. Um, the fact the Constitution could only be a man, I forget if it's two thirds or three, three thirds of a vote, but that means that there would never be a constitutional amendment to prohibit slavery. So our, our founding document, the Constitution, um, protects protected slavery. And, and so it really, in a way, even though racism has been around for a long time, it in a way instituted racism, which even though we have three amendments right after the Civil War that, um, that give voting rights to freed slaves and gives you know, other rights to freed slaves, the, the 13th, 14th, 15th Amendments. Um, Reconstruction, Jim Crow laws of the late uh, 19th century, the violence against people of color. Um, I mean, all, all of these things have, have led to where we are now, which is a country that is hopefully coming to this late slavery. Um, and to me, I, it's kind of hopeful that uh, something that has, hasn't been fully addressed, and maybe it would have been fully addressed if Lincoln had, um, had, had lived. I, I, I think Lincoln might have addressed this and tried to heal the country in that way. But, uh, but it's finally, finally being addressed, and uh, I, I think there's some optimism and some hope there for me that uh, this scourge of racism that I see directly going back to is uh, is is being 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 acknowledged and dealt with. I don't know if that's the answer you wanted. <laughs> Thank you. Can I ask about the state song? I, I we've only been here thirteen years and. And I'd never actually heard it sung before. Um, it seems hopelessly dated. Who wrote it? <laughs> Who wrote it? Well, and if, first of all, thank you for thinking I'm a singer. <laughs> <laughs> My understanding is that Pat Garrett's daughter wrote a song. Uh, is that, is that, does anybody okay. think of something else? Uh, and an interesting story with her, right? I think her name was Elizabeth, Elizabeth Darren, and she was blind. Um, she had been blind, I think, from birth or soon after birth, but she was a talented musician. Uh, and so um, she wrote the song, not, not right at statehood, I think it was a two, three, four years later, and it was, became more official. Um, and what's really interesting, uh, uh, um, as, um, as Barb said, I'm an atomic man, and I found an account, I think it was in the book, who was one of my mentors at the University of New Mexico, um, is that Elizabeth Garrett on July 16th, 1945, is being driven from Socorro up to Albuquerque for a music lesson in the early, in the, um, um, it was still dark out, and I think, as you all know, that was when uh, the Trinity test happened at 5.30 on July 16th. She was blind, but she said, what was that? Somehow she, she perceived that the explosion had happened all oh, probably 30 miles away, 40 miles away from where she was in the car. Well, I just, I thought this was a, a, a great presentation and thank you so much, John.